Hey, what's up guys? Today is Friday, July 17th. It's 8.55 p.m. and the temperature is 27 degrees Celsius. I'm here in downtown Toronto and this is the intersection of Young and Queen. And I'm currently walking north on Young Street. Let's look west down Queen Street West. The plan for this walk is to head north up to the intersection of Young and Dundas, and then I'll head west along Dundas Street. I'll travel through the Little Tokyo area and Chinatown to Spadina Avenue where I'll head south. And then I think I'll take Adelaide Street over to St. Andrew Station. Sundown tonight is expected at 8.55 p.m., which is right now. So it should be getting pretty dark soon. I don't think you'll catch me on a bike like that anytime soon. Certainly one of those only in downtown Toronto kind of moments. That there on the left is the Eaton Center. Last I checked, it was the busiest shopping mall in North America. And if you're wondering, it is open for business as part of stage two here in the province of Ontario. But Toronto hasn't yet moved on to stage three. So what that entails is restaurants and bars can only serve customers on outdoor patio areas. This here is Shooter Street. I've done a few walks that came along here recently at St. Mike's Hospital where that bridge is hanging over the street. I have to say it's a bit surreal being down here on a Friday night and seeing it like this even though things are open. It is a lot less busy than it would normally be on a summer Friday night. There's a noticeable absence of younger people out on the streets. There's probably a lot less people from the suburbs who often come into the city on Friday and Saturday nights to drink and party. And of course, there's a lot less American tourists and other international tourists. And based on how the coronavirus is doing south of the border, I wouldn't expect things to even remotely look like normal until probably next summer at this rate. This is the Mervish Theatre, formerly the Pantages Theatre. It looks like Hamilton is supposed to be playing there, but obviously it's not at the moment. There's the Three Brewers Microbrewery. 
they've got a few locations here in the city. The one on Adelaide Street has a nice big patio, so I'm not sure if that one's open right now, but the Young Street location obviously isn't. Wouldn't be a trip to this area without hearing a few street preachers. And let him return unto the Lord. Let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy on him. Take a look at Dundas Square. On the corner here, this used to be a hard rock cafe. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. It's always been a popular meeting spot among various bikers. And this is the first time I've seen the fountains operating here this year. That's nice to see. The events and festivals that usually take place here on weekend evenings and nights have been cancelled this year. That's good to see. People can still enjoy the square. Again, this is a fraction of the people you would normally see here. So this is the intersection of Young and Dundas we're approaching. You can't access Dundas Station from any of the street corners here. So look at the 505 streetcar that runs east to west along Dundas. This is a scramble crossing. So it stopped the traffic from all four sides. The words we confess keep us in bondage. This is how Satan works to defeat us and maintain strongholds in our lives. It's our responsibility to obey God and not be caught unaware, not to fall into the devil's trap, not to fall into his lies. That's often a busy corner for uh, street be sober, buskers. To be vigilant because our adversary, the devil, There's got to be some sort of noise bylaw this guy's breaking. That's way too loud. We're all entitled to freedom of speech, but. That guy is just overbearing everything in this intersection, probably preventing a lot of people from enjoying their evening around here. There's the flagship Canadian Muji store across the street on the atrium on Bay. So this is Dundas Street West, which I'm walking west on. Right here on the left is a restaurant called Joey. This patio didn't previously stretch out onto the sidewalk, but that's been a common theme these days. This part of the Eaton Center here is a new addition. Well, new as in 2006. It houses the Ryerson Faculty of Business, along with a Best Buy, Canadian Tire, and a few other retailers. You can see the physical distancing markers for lining up to get into Best Buy that they place on the sidewalk. There's often a long line to get into here lately, as well as Canadian Tire. And this here is Bay Street, which we're approaching.
Bay Street runs from the lake up to the northern border of downtown. That's the new city hall to the south, as well as the financial district, which Bay Street runs right down the middle of. And just on the other side of the street, on the left there, is Uncle Tetsu's Cheesecake Factory. That's one of the establishments, or establishments that have helped led to this area, being dubbed as Little Tokyo or Little Japan. I think that name sprung up sometime in the mid-2010s, as there's been a pretty heavy influx of Japanese cuisine in this area, and a Denny's, of course. I'm not actually aware of any other Denny's locations in Toronto. The only other one I know in Ontario even is up in Niagara Falls. There used to be one in Mississauga. There's Don Don Izakaya. It's a very entertaining place to have a meal. It's a pretty authentic Izakaya experience. And these places, chat times always seem to have a pretty big lineup going on. I think that's just a Taiwanese bubble tea style shop. So this area was originally the first Chinatown in downtown Toronto. It started in the early, early 1900s, and up until the 1950s, it was located here. But the city expropriated this land to build the new city hall, which is, that's the backside of it. And then most of the Chinese establishments migrated west to the area around Spadina and Dundas, which is sometimes referred to as West Chinatown. Toronto has a number of Chinese areas, but that would be the main one most people associate with Chinatown. Seven seconds, but there's no traffic. Uncle Tetsu's used to operate what they called an angel cafe just down here on the left. It was a dessert cafe, but I think they were trying to be reminiscent of the Japanese made cafes. At least the marketing made it appear that way. But of course, if you've ever been to a Japanese made cafe, you'd know it's a very unusual kind of establishment. Here it is, it was in the top floor of Uncle Tetsu's to go. I have no idea what it is now. It just says global office on it. Here's the lineup, another dessert place it looks like. And this here is University Avenue, which I'm approaching. I don't know. 
just to the north here is Queen's Park, the Provincial Legislative Assembly, as Ontario is the, or Toronto is the capital of Ontario. There's a number of the city's most prominent hospitals just to the north. And to the south, you can get a look at the CN Tower. That's the Shangri-La Hotel straight ahead, that tall glass tower, and an angry man shouting in the bike lane. Who's quite possibly very unstable. And this is the entrance to St. Patrick Subway Station. You'll often see people get stuck in this median in the middle here on University crossing the street as the timer doesn't give you a lot of time to cross, cross the street here. It's quite a wide street and it goes down really fast. There's Toronto 52 Division, one of the most well-known police stations here in the city. I remember Googling it at some point and seeing that it had a two-star rating. I didn't know people rated police stations, but I can't imagine if you're going to visit a police station and end up leaving a review online, it's going to be because you had a positive experience. I know a number of people that have had their bicycle stolen. They report it to the police and the police just kind of shrug their shoulders and don't really do anything. And what can they do really? It's just one of those crappy situations for everyone. You can, of course, register your bike serial number with them, and if it ever turns up, they can reach out and contact you, which does happen from time to time, so it's definitely a good idea. But if your bike is stolen, it's pretty much gone. Yesterday I went through a walk that took me through Moss Park, which should be uploaded by now. And there was a couple of tents where a few people had a very large number of bicycles, which I'm sure they didn't purchase. Another thing you can do is of course, keep an eye on Craigslist and Kijiji and Facebook Marketplace because some people might be dumb enough to steal a bike and immediately put it up for sale. Then again, with consequences so low, who's to blame them? So this is McCall Street. That's the Village Idiot Pub on the corner there. Just to the north is Baldwin Village, a really nice underrated spot. It's even got a Krispy Kreme Donuts. And to the left is OCAD University, the Ontario College of Art and Design. That building that looks like it's on stilts was designed by Will Aslop. It's a very polarizing building in the city. People tend to love it or hate it. And on the left here is the Art Gallery of Ontario. It was redesigned back in 2008 by Frank Gehry. 
and I think I saw that it's opening on July 23rd. It looks kind of like a giant submarine looming over the street. This is the front of an art dealership. It's kind of an inverse 3D Vincent Van Gogh. This is the 3D side that's sticking out. You often saw people taking pictures or see people taking pictures in front of that. I'm planning on doing a narrated walk through Chinatown in the daytime at some point, so I'll probably be back along the street when you can get a better look at things. And the next street is Beverly Street, so this is kind of where the western Chinatown picks up. So I'll only be cutting through probably about a quarter of the main retail area of Chinatown. And behind the art gallery is quite a nice downtown park called Grange Park. You can access it from McCall Street on the left or this street here, Beverly. Or you could take John Street up from Queen to it. If you follow this street, to the north, it'll turn into St. George Street, which will run through the University of Toronto campus and head up to DuPont. That would be Grange Park just down there. And with no traffic, I'm gonna jaywalk. Because I think it's a bit more interesting on this side of Dundas. Again, it's hard to imagine this is 9.20 p.m. on a Sunday night or a Friday night. But for this time on any night, in any season, in any weather, weather conditions, this is still extremely surreal to experience Korea or a Chinatown like this. I wanted to say Koreatown there as I was looking at Kachi. They used to have a location up in Koreatown and one over in Kensington Market. I do believe this Chinatown is primarily Cantonese speaking among those of Chinese descent that live here. Whereas I believe out in the suburbs in areas such as Markham and Mississauga, it's primarily Mandarin speaking. Someone can fact check me on that in the comments if I'm wrong. To look down Huron Street. And it'll take you up to 
Baldwin Village if you make a right on Baldwin. I think in any big city you travel to, it's always worth checking out Chinatown. They always seem to be quite different from city to city. For instance, Bangkok's is such that it's pretty much a giant street food market. Everyone's walking on the street with the cars. It's so crowded. And every little alleyway and side street is just full of street food vendors. New York has a, a great one. It feels a lot less open than this. It's a lot narrower. But in terms of the establishments it has, it's a, quite similar to Toronto's. I'm not sure if this is the biggest Chinatown in North America or not. So this is Spadina Avenue, which would be sort of the main street that runs north and south through Chinatown. There's a look up north. Just in behind those buildings there is Kensington Market, which I'll come back and do a walk through. And this is south on Spadina Avenue. That's the Spadina streetcar, the 510 running down those dedicated streetcar tracks in the middle. They added the streetcar to Spadina in 1997. Before then, there was a bus. Here's a sad sight. White bicycle marking the death of a cyclist in that area. If you're curious as to what this area looked like back in the 80s and early 90s, there is a music video you can look up on YouTube called Spadina Bus. It's quite a well-known song among those here in Toronto by a jazz fusion band whose name is escaping me. But I'm certain if you just pop Spadina Bus into YouTube, the video will pop up. The song is, of course, named after the bus that used to run down this street. It's like the Vietnamese restaurants over there have outdoor seating set up. That one in particular is uh, quite popular with the after bar crowd at night. And if you go way back in time, there was a streetcar on Spadina before the bus. So they've, they had a streetcar, which they ripped out and replaced with the bus. And then they added the streetcar back. There's a hot pot restaurant that's operating outside. I don't think that person will be back for their uh, bendy wheel. Bike thefts are a huge problem in the city. Normally a lot of these restaurants would be still doing a good business this late.
The lighting's not very good over there on the sidewalk, so I'm trying to stay over here to the edge. This camera does pretty well in low light conditions, but you have to be careful if it gets too dark. It is a pretty small sensor, so I have to be mindful of that. So we are exiting Chinatown. And the next major street just to the south is Queen Street West. Sorry, if things are a bit dark right now, it should lighten up shortly. I don't know if you can see, but there are Chinese characters under that street sign. I believe those are traditional, not simplified Chinese characters. That street car will go all the way down to Union Station. So it'll head south and it'll make a left on Queens Key which runs along the lakefront. And then it'll dip it underground and head north up to Union Station. And it terminates at Spadina Station, which is at Bloor Street to the north of here. This is Queen Street West. I came through here a week ago on Friday night and filmed a video. It was a bit later than this. About 10 minutes walking that way is where this walk started at Queen and Young in front of the Eaton Center. I believe that used to be a steak restaurant. Perhaps one of the victims of this virus. So this here is Richmond Street, which is a one-way street. Traffic runs to the west. In this area and to our left is the entertainment district. There's a bike lane which runs along Richmond. For a bar with a tiny patio, they're certainly doing a good business. I think maybe some of the patios aren't doing as well as they thought they might when they reopened as people are still a bit hesitant to come out. And a night like this where there was a chance of rain, it's not really worth coming out if your night's gonna get spoiled and there's no indoor options. 
There's a dummy riding her bike on the sidewalk. Don't do that if you're an adult. She didn't even have a light on at night. Which is particularly dangerous and inconsiderate. So this here is Adelaide Street. So I'll be heading east. This will take us through the financial district. The lighting looks a little better on the other side, so I'll cross over. Coast is clear. There's a bike lane along here as well. It was installed in 2014. And it was a bit controversial at the time. It was well known for taxis and delivery trucks. And other people just parking their cars in it. So a lot of the cyclists were posting pictures online of the vehicles and making it be known that their license plate numbers would be seen. I think things have settled down since then quite a bit. There's a restaurant with a patio that's doing well. One block south of here is King Street. Which would be one of the busiest streets in Toronto on a Friday night. This is Peter Street. I recorded a walk down here last week. I went down to the lake. About 15 years ago, if you came down Adelaide Street or Richmond Street, which is a block to the north of here, especially on a Friday or Saturday night, you'd notice a whole lot of nightlife, as a lot of the city's clubs and bars were concentrated. But since then, most of that has shifted down to King Street. It didn't help that a lot of condos were built in this area and people moved in and complained about the noise at night. Yeah, right? So like that's the most you could acknowledge up until then. This might have been where Turbo Nightclub was, if I can recall. 326, that sounds familiar. Just look at the CN Tower all lit up. This area was also well known for the police coming out around last call, 2 a.m. on those Friday and Saturday nights.
Monte Cito, I think that place is called. We've got a pretty busy patio going on. I never quite understood the idea of last call. Why have this arbitrary time when all the bars have to stop serving customers? And then they just end up flooding all these drunken kids onto the street at the same time. Of course you're gonna get fights and problems. It's a pretty stupid concept. If they simply let them run till four or so, people would go home whenever they're tired or feel like they'd eventually adjust. There's the only downtown Hooters. It looks like they have a upstairs patio. Looks like we've got a busy patio going on over here. Take a brief detour. This is John Street. And this is the Fox and the Fiddle. Back during those days when this area was sort of the main clubbing district, the Fox and the Fiddle was occupying an old house. It was a very different, it was more of a traditional kind of pub. Remember they had a punching bag upstairs. It certainly doesn't look like that kind of place now. Here's a number of patios on John Street. Just the office pub and a few more. Come on, let's head north up here to Richmond Street. And then I'll come back around. I think it'll be a bit more interesting that way. Where this Marshalls is on the left was built, I believe, as a Sega Palladium, which is a big Dave and Buster style arcade. It later turned into a mega club called Circa, which didn't last too long. Changed names a few more times, and now it's a Marshalls. And that's the Scotiabank Theater. It used to be known as the Paramount when it was operated by famous players. <laughs> this here on the right is the ballroom. Inside our bowling lanes, you could classify it as a bowling pub. But of course, that part is not yet open. And this is Richmond Street West. <laughs> and I wandered into a no man's land here. Where the ballroom is used to be a bar called Montana. And often on the street corner, there would be different promoters for all the different clubs that were in this area. They'd try to give you a, a ticket for free cover and some kind of drink deal. And then they would walk you into the club. And I'm sure they would take a cut. In fact, you couldn't walk down the street on a Friday or Saturday night without getting harassed by someone trying to lead you into a club. And I did not know this was here. But there's a very large patio space set up across the street. I'll go check that out and take a look. Looks like they've recently resurfaced Richmond.
Well, that's pretty neat. There's Chum 1050. Which is one of the Toronto radio stations. And I think that used to be Whiskey Saigon, which was a, one of the big mega clubs down here. Social. It used to be known as Easy on the Fifth. There's Yuck Yucks over there. Probably the city's most well-known comedy club. I've seen a number of fairly big acts there. The stage configuration is a little awkward. They used to have a location up at Young and Eglinton in Midtown. But that's since become absolute comedy. I'm not sure if comedy clubs will be able to open as part of stage three. Yeah. I would hope so. That's certainly an industry that's been hard hit by this stupid virus. This is Simcoe Street, so I'll just take this straight to University Avenue. And then I will head south down to St. Andrew Station and call it a walk. There's an unfortunate sight. Must be tough living on the streets in a near cashless society. It used to be I'd always have $2 coins in my pocket or even $1 coins. And I'd usually make it a point to give them out whenever I saw someone in need, but I really don't know what the solution is to that these days. So this is University Avenue. I'm heading southbound. And straight ahead will be Adelaide Street, where we were earlier. And then just south of there will be St. Andrew Station. There's Momofuku. Fairly well-known noodle restaurant. And this is the Shangri-La Hotel I'm walking next to. It's also a condominium. I think it was built in 2008 if memory serves me correct.
All right, let's cross the street. So we're entering the financial district. This is sort of the western edge of it. That building there with the LED light running up the side used to be the Trump Tower Toronto. It's now the St. Regis Hotel and Condo. I remember hearing about that tower for a very long time before it was built. It was always something of a, almost a myth that we were getting a Trump Tower. Of course, this was back at a time when having a Trump branded tower might be seen as a good thing for your city. Chicago got one around the same time as we got ours. And that brand might have no problem surviving in the US and other parts of the world, but I think Canadians would rather distance themselves from that name. So this is King Street. And here is St. Andrew Station. Street is served by a streetcar. I'll flip my mask up and head down in. We pay our fares with the Presto card system here in Toronto. It was a bit controversial when they first started to integrate it with the Toronto Transit Commission. A lot of people sort of wondered out loud why the province would build this, or the province's uh, transit agency, Metrolinx, would build this smart card from scratch, one that was full of bugs and various problems for the longest time, when they could have purchased an existing system and adapted it. Something along the lines of the Oyster system that they use in London, or T-Money that they use in Korea, Suica in Japan. A lot of those other systems are distance-based. Ours is fare-based. It is mandatory to wear masks down here in the subway, but it seems to be completely unenforced. I'd say about 90% of the people are wearing masks that I see in the subways, but a good number of those people aren't wearing them correctly. They're wearing them underneath their nose or just down around their chin, or they're constantly playing with them and adjusting them. So I think there ought to be some type of public health information given on how to wear a mask. 
It should, of course, cover your nose and mouth, or it's not really doing anything. In fact, it's just giving a false illusion of you being a safe, considerate person. Here comes the train now, so thanks for watching guys and let me know your comments down below and I'll catch you on the next one. Yeah, we have to do it.